Good evening, everybody. I am Madog. And I am Devar Akvaron. Before beginning the show, I have a question for you. Devar? Yes? Devar? Yes? Devar? Madhog? <laughs> Devar? <laughs> Yes? <laughs> Are we running with the wolves tonight? different people to be that it's strange so strange you got to pick up every stitch you got to pick up every stitch you got to pick up every stitch of the witch Must be the season of the witch oh, Must be the season of the witch Hello, welcome back to the resurrection of uh, Dramatis Sermo, the podcast in which we chat and talk and occasionally review, accidentally in the process, various forms of art and media that we enjoy, or hate, or Or somewhere along the lines that we watch, that we experience, that we read and or get exposed to. You know, like radiation, (laughs) if you will. Of course. (laughs) (laughs) So it's been a while since we uh, had the chance to properly formulate analytical thoughts <laughs> via this particular show. It's about time we brought it back, I say. What are we reviewing tonight, Devar? I mean, well, it's-, uh, it's pretty obvious what we are reviewing. If you look at the title and yeah, the very the title. elaborate cold opening... <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and the description of the video, it might kind of hint to you that we are talking about... And the about... thumbnail! Don't forget yeah, yeah, the, thumbnail. the thumbnail. Yeah, oh yeah, the thumbnail, that's very important. We are going to be talking about Wolfwalkers. Yes, the latest animated enterprise by Irish-based uh, film studio Cartoon Saloon, and also the latest uh, Ton Moore-led project. I'm going to Which give is... you this stage in a minute, Davar. In yeah. a second, you are going to give us all the deets and the hot takes and the warm and semi-cold takes as well. The tiramisu of takes are welcome too. <laughs> and those are pretty delicious, I must say. We are going to have a proper dive into the past and the present of this studio and why everything they do deserves your undivided attention. But before we do all that... Yeah. Wolfwalkers, it has just come out. By the time of this recording, it has been released on uh, Apple TV. I believe that's the only way to watch it right now, because, you know, it's been a year. (laughs) It could not have a theatrical release. But on the other hand, that might have been for the best, because it enjoyed a lot of success through the digital distribution platform from what i've seen we loved it didn't we yes yes i certainly loved it loved it so much it doesn't go into my favorite movies list it goes into my treasured movies list (laughs) psst the treasure is a metaphor for his heart exactly (laughs) which is also a metaphor it doesn't literally take the film and put it inside his bleeding beating heart that would be painful (laughs) 
Uh, it's a film that really speaks to me on many levels. Absolutely. So I connected with it as much as Fallacy 9 I have connected with, essentially. Okay, and well, I have connected... No, 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 no. Connected doesn't quite paint the image. I have resonated with this cinematic digestis, with this work of art, and everything it does, and how it does it, and what it puts onto the table, and what I pick up from the table and eat with gluttony and unrestrained passion, I say, yes, if you can just gorge yourself with food with passion. This film is a buffet, that was made for me, and I am going to stop before this analogy goes into wilder and more wilder places. Hey, much like, you know, wild animals, like yeah. wolves, which are wild, which means they are free. And this will all tie in very cleverly <laughs> into the theming of it all. <laughs> yes, a, a very well executed theme, I say. <laughs> yes. So let's get into the nitty and the gritty and the beauty and the beastie, if you will. Let's uh, have ourselves a quick round to properly introduce, for those who don't know, the history of Cartoon Saloon, its legacy, its productions, so on and so forth. So, Davar, the stage, as I promised, is yours. Make it yours. <laughs> So, Cartoon Saloon is an Irish-based uh, animation company. Yes. Uh, their first outing was with the movie The Secret of Kells. It was nominated for Best uh, Animated Feature, if I am remembering correctly. I honestly don't remember that part either. It was. Just... Yes, it was. I can confirm it was. Okay, good. Of course it didn't win, because that might as well be called the Disney Pixar Award. (laughs) Of course. The Secret of Kells, uh, on overview of what I felt of the film upon its release, uh, it was uh, really nicely animated, you know, and very beautiful to look at. Story, not so good. I mean, it was okay, but nothing... Okay. To write home about, essentially. If I have to, if I have to barge in violently, I'd say that it had the right ideas, it had ambition, it had an immediately unique and recognizable style that only vaguely reminded me of Gandhi Tartakovsky at the time, (laughs) if I'm being honest. It was imbued with uh, the history and the mythology of Ireland. The problem is that all of that history, that historical context and the mythology they were not well presented, especially not to an audience that would not be privy of said history and mythology. The film also did not have a very lengthy running time. It was around 70-something minutes. Definitely not enough to tell the story wanted to tell, and it felt rushed because of that. It had problems with structure and pacing, Everything in between, it was essentially what it was. A first yeah. attempt, a first it try. Pretty much a first attempt, but it did well enough for them to get another chance for a second project. By the way, Madhog will probably tell you to keep the secret of Kells in mind for later. Well, you just told them, so I don't need to. <laughs> Thank that's you. Why I, that's why I said that. So the next outing was Song of the Sea. Okay, I I should tell you that in between all the major film features, they also had uh, several short subject films released throughout the years. I've seen a handful of them in a recently concluded online film festival, of all things. That was not my own (laughs) film festival. Just for context, they've been busy with everything they do. So, Well, this is why we have each other, to add extra information between... (laughs) Song of the Sea, as like with Secret of Kells, I will say overall, the second outing was a lot better. There was a lot more emotional gravitas to the situation the story was telling that felt more personal. And it used the Irish mythology to its advantage to add to the beauty of the animation they were. It did a much better job in establishing its mythos and uh, their 
importance to the plot and the themes that they wanted to explore. We should go back to that film at some point. I think it deserves to have its own analysis. We should all go back to revisit all the films by this studio and give them the time that they need. But this podcast isn't about them, isn't it? Yeah, it's because essentially I did my homework on wolf walkers, so... Yes, but I would like to add that both Song of the Sea and The Secret of Kells were directed by Tom Moore. When I saw Song of the Sea back in the day, when did it come out again? Uh, let me double check that real quick for you. Yes, we are professional podcasters, by the way. <laughs> yeah, totally professional. Let's just uh, pretend that we are. 2014 it came out. Yes, 2014. When uh, Song of the Sea came out in 2014, well, of course I was wowed and marveled by everything I saw. It reminded me slightly, and perhaps a bit unfairly, of uh, the storyline from Spirited Away which probably is what led me to compare Tom Moore to Hayao Miyazaki. I called him the Irish Miyazaki, which would make Cartoon Saloon the Irish equivalent of Studio Ghibli. That's an unfair comparison, especially when we get to The Breadwinner, which is also part of their filmography, but it's not a Tom Moore-led project. And that's why it feels very different from everything else. I will say with that in mind, uh, I think uh, it's most important to find what makes a studio or a artist their own beast rather than compare them to another person. Yes. They can take they can take inspiration, yes, but it's how they use that inspiration that's important. <laughs> However, I will still maintain that there is one specific element of this studio and the people who work in it and what they put out on a regular basis that's still very much comparable to Studio Ghibli. And that would be? Much like Studio Ghibli at the height of its popularity and uh, quality, there is nothing that looks or feels quite like what they're putting out. It is unique and recognizable, and you cannot mistake it for any other studio or style. It's the only Irish animation studio I know. It's probably not the only one that exists, but it's the only one who has made some sort of dent or impression on an international level. It uses Irish mythology, and indeed even classic medieval or renaissance Irish paintings, depiction of classic mythological characters in that sense, has the backgrounds and the backdrops of their films, which enhance the art direction. But anyway, after the first experiment in Secret of Kells, and uh, their first uh, proper outing in uh, Song of the Sea, and that interesting but not as impressive, in my personal opinion, side project in The Breadwinner, Which I will add was based on a uh, novel. (gasps) Yes. It's another little element that's comparable to Studio Ghibli, if you really want to force (laughs) this comparison. Much of their work was based on uh, Western novels. Of course. (laughs) Uh, I should also point out as well that Tom Moore, these three films that we're talking about, The Secret of Kells, The Song of the Sea, and when we get to it, Wolf Walkers, this is actually considered a trilogy of films right now. (laughs) I can definitely see that. There is definitely something there thematically, not just in the way the Irish mythology is used. And if you want to delve even more into this idea, then Wolf Walkers definitely feels like the apology... No, the apology is too harsh. The natural succession the natural evolution, the realization of the full potential that Secret of Kells had. Yes, we're yeah. going back to Secret of Kells now, huh? It's, you see yes. how clever we are. <laughs> yes, because there's a reason for that, and we'll get into that soon. Yeah, I will say that based on their first outing, which was just okay, just a spectacle and all that, and then the Song of the Sea, they got stronger, and then the third movie, Wolf Walkers. It certainly feels like as if they know what their strengths are and know what they're doing at this point. 
This and is their Princess Mononoke, if you want to force another Studio Ghibli reference. Oh, you get the you, idea. <laughs> funny you say that, but I'll get into that later. Well, I'd say that it is their magnum opus so far. But again, the studio has only been alive for a decade or so. Yeah, and that's still kind of young for a studio, isn't it? With Absolutely. Only... But so, I think this is the point in which they have honed their craft to their highest possible standard, but in a way that doesn't feel like it's the peak of what they can do, in a way that tells us this is what we can do, and we're going to put out even better projects, even better films. There is an enthusiasm, is what I'm trying to convey. There is a passion that this film exudes, that everything they do exudes a vitality and an energy that's, first of all, contagious, obviously. Yes. And it resonates with us because it is so passionate about what it does and what it conveys, what it wants to tell you, but most importantly, how it chooses to tell you. Wolf Walkers is currently their best work. Yes. <laughs> so, anyway, we get to Wolf Walkers now, I believe. Yes, the uh, very unfortunate release of 2020. At the very tail end of this year. Me and the fiancé, we watched this on uh, on Christmas Day, I believe it was. And uh, it was the best Christmas present ever. <laughs> yes. I showed it to her and, and I said to her, we need to watch this movie. This so is... I thank you for bringing this to my attention. Ah, uh, you're very welcome. This is Cinema, with a capital C, and I, also a capital I, a capital N, uh, screw it, it's all in cap locks. <laughs> this is <laughs> Cinema in <laughs> cap locks, if cinema. you will. If you would like to indulge me into my unabashed gashing of this film, because I don't know if I made that clear, but I really liked it. <laughs> Yes, I think we all know that we both really, really like this film a lot. With all of that uh, preamble out of the way, let's talk more in depth about Wolf Walkers and why we like it so much. Yes, and maybe some interesting tidbits here and there. Mind you, though, because it's still fairly new, new information might come out that would be more interesting, but because of time and all that and not all the details are out, that means, you know, I'm working with what I've got. I'm going to read the synopsis of Wolf Walkers. A young apprentice hunter and her father journey to Ireland. They come from England, by the way. It doesn't say here, but they come from England and they go to Ireland to help wipe out the last wolf pack. But everything changes when the Fire Nation attacks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But everything changes when she befriends a free-spirited girl from a mysterious tribe rumored to transform into wolves by night. In a time of superstition and magic, when wolves are seen as demonic and nature and evil to be tamed, a young apprentice hunter, Robin, it's all in cap locks for some inexplicable reason, comes to <laughs> Ireland with her father to wipe out the last pack. It's just repeating it. But when Robin saves a wild native girl... Okay, you know what? This is the last time I ever read a plot summary from the IMDb page of a film. Wow. I'm never doing this again, okay? That's a, that's a mess. <laughs> This is just an unnecessary second paragraph that was written by someone. It literally says here, someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the author of this. Right. But the first half, the first paragraph, the one that actually makes sense, that one is the official descriptor of the film. You can find that very same synopsis on the Apple TV page of the film, where you are supposed to be watching it legally. So, right off the bat, this synopsis is a bit uh, misleading. Robin is not a young apprentice hunter, or rather, it is implied she was once hunting and foraging with her father, but she's not really an apprentice hunter in the narrative context of the film. She is the daughter of a wolf hunter. 
Her father is played by Sean Bean. <laughs> so... By the way, uh, by the way, just I'm not sure when I'm going to be able to drop this little tidbit. You might... might as well drop it now. Yes, I might as well drop this now, considering who the actor is. But apparently this is the second time that two actors, namely Sean Bean and Maria Doyle Kennedy, have co-starred together on a film together. Their last outing together was on a film called Jupiter Ascending, which was on 2015. Oh, no! Why? No! You mean to tell me Wolf Walker says a link yes. <laughs> to <laughs> Jupiter Ascending? <laughs> You're ruining should, my life, man. I should, I should tell you that... Uh, Sean Bean plays, uh, as you said, the hunter, the father of yes. the main character. While I'll t- I'll just call her Maria. She plays as the mother of the other child in this film. Oh, that's interesting, actually, considering what happens in the film, which we will not be spoiling. <laughs> this is probably one film we will not spoil, so... Uh, no... We will talk about the themes and the certain plot points in general strokes to give you an idea of what this film is about, but we don't really have the need to spoil it because we want you to watch it, obviously. Yes, you should watch it. And when you don't watch it, maybe come back here if you are interested in the tidbits I will share. <laughs> so anyways, I was saying, this girl, Robin... She is the daughter of the hunter, not really his apprentice, mostly because her father is very overbearing and overprotective after the mom passed away, because of course she did. (laughs) So he he wants her to be a good girl, to remain in the city, in the town, which is a walled-off medieval town. It's the town of Kilkennedy, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for that. Actually, it's actually based on an actual place, which we'll go into more detail later. It doesn't surprise me, considering that the villain of the piece is also a real-life historical figure. They do not say in the film outright who it is, but uh, I think the picture of a certain somebody might ring some bells and might... uh, Basically, the design of the villain kind of looks eerily similar to a certain historical figure that was mm, highly controversial and divides people, and Ireland hate him. I think that's one of the so-called spoilers we need to address, because it has to do with the very important historical context in which the film takes place, because the historical context really ties in with the theming of the Which film. Is... It's used as the backdrop for the much more intimate narrative that is a parallel to what Ireland was going through at the yeah. time. But, which is funny because you can actually watch this film without knowing this historical context at all and you would still get the same enjoyment out of it. Then again, everything you really need to know about the historical context is laid out perfectly in the text, while certain other details are more subtextual, like that. But we know right off the bat that this takes place in Ireland in the year 1650. We are in the midst of the English colonization. That's one way of calling it. The English oppression is going strong. There is Very a strong. there is a so-called Lord Protector overseeing it. Yeah, which is an actual real life title, my ad, at that moment in time. Should we say who this guy is finally? He is based on Oliver Cromwell. Oliver freaking Cromwell. The man and- who stared down with the monarchy. <laughs> and and I guess up with me as the king? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much up with me as the only person to fix everything and get rid of those pesky Catholics. Yes, that's important. There is a line in the film explicitly telling what his intentions are. He says, and I'm going to paraphrase, I will tame this land. He's saying that in the specific context of killing the wolves, 
expanding the town, cutting off all the trees, essentially enforcing his idea of a civilization onto the land. The subtext of it is clearly, I'm going to tame all the Irish. I'm going to tame Ireland and enforce my religious bigotry and my cultural oppression on them. He is quite obviously the embodiment of English imperialism in that sense. And it works really well as the villain of the piece, considering what the film is about. Yes, especially about oppression of freedom and putting people into... uh, Cages, which are both literal and metaphorical cages. Yes. The cage of society, with its rules and restrictions imposed by a authority figure that was not chosen by the people, but rather was enforced on them. The film is about escaping the societal restrictions and finding the courage to embrace life's unknowns, self-expression, the freedom of being who you are meant to be. At its core, this film is a a power fantasy, in the most uh, universally relatable way imaginable. But the way it goes about it is what makes the difference with other films of this ilk. And they would be many other stories of this ilk. There have been many accounts, many stories that are specifically about rebelling against society. With all the interpretations and readings that this particular parable could have. But before we go there, and we stay there for the rest of the podcast... Yes. (laughs) Why don't we further establish what the subtext is, what the historical subtext is for this film? What was Oliver Cromwell up to at the time? Well, he was he basically settled in Ireland and invaded many places and uh, decided to take control and have his way with the land, essentially. There is mention of a rebellion in the film that he was about yeah, to, to the, go and to the uh, south, essentially. <laughs> suppress, yes. Yeah. So he says the South, which tells to me that this is taking place in Northern Ireland, which is still under British domination to this day. In the list of towns and villages he basically took over, Kilkennedy was actually one of the few that actually existed. So this actually does exist in real life at that moment in time in history, so it's not made up. It's clear that this film takes a bit of a fantastical approach to history as it very obviously deviates from it. Yeah, 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 it does a bit. (laughs) Like I said, it's a power fantasy. An Irish power fantasy. So, down with the Lord Protector, obviously. (laughs) That's not a spoiler, that's a promise, really, that the film makes to you. That's pretty much what one of the characters says, actually. Down with the Lord Protector. Yes, and he gets encaged for it. Obviously. Yeah. This guy was a bastard. I'm actually going to uh, tell you, because this film represents this guy perfectly as Oliver Cromwell, based on this actual historical quote that he actually said, and I will paraphrase this. Okay, so after he had his troops kill 3,500 people after a town's capture, compromising 2,700 royal soldiers, and even killed civilians and Catholics in the process. After the aftermath, he said this, and I quote, I am persuaded that this is a righteous judgment of God upon these barbarous wretches who have imbrued their hands in so much innocent blood and that it will tend to prevent the infusion of blood for the future, which are satisfactory grounds for such actions which otherwise cannot but work, remorse, and regret. In short, he's a heartless bastard who takes any reason to uh, impose what he thinks is the right thing to do. The ends justify the means. It sounds like every religious bigoted antagonist in any story ever told (laughs) by the sound of it. Yes. Which he was, really. He is. In, and this is in real life, <laughs> and yes. and I'm pretty I'm pretty sure he says something similar to this 
in the film, but he, in... he does say it, but the film is technically a family film, so references to his higher cause, religion, and God are tamer than you would well, expect them to be, but still, they get referenced quite a bit. Because the important aspects of his character match the historical figure to a T, essentially, that he's all about oppression, enforcing his own views of what he believes is the right thing to do, I say with quotations. Isn't that the driving mentality of the English throughout history? <laughs> Well, of all tyrants, really, of all people who think they are in the right about their cause and their beliefs, but it is especially egregious with the long, long history of English expansionism. <laughs> yes, pretty much. And so, yeah, this kind of fits the bill, so to speak, and it's quite terrifying to think that such a thing happened. So imagine that Irish directors and animators make an Irish film in which an Englishman is the bad guy. Who would have thought? <laughs> breath of fresh air, honestly. Yes, it is. It is indeed a breath of fresh air. I remember that in Secret of Kells, which was set in medieval times, the bad guys were this nebulous evil force of Vikings. Yeah, they're pretty who much... Who at the time had already conquered most of Britannia. And they were yeah. aiming for Ireland since they were at it, I guess. Speaking of the secret of Kells, I mentioned before that uh, Wolf Walkers pretty much feels like the natural succession to Secret of Kells. Because yeah. it has a very similar premise. There is a walled off town as our main setting, which has a forest in front of it. And there is a girl who turns into a wolf in it. Yes, by the way, that's what a wolf walker would be in Irish folklore. People yeah. who turn into wolf. It's basically a very simplistic way of putting it. It's their version of the werewolf myth. But yeah. it's a bit more interesting, in my opinion. The other thing that uh, bridges the gap between Secret of Kells and the uh, Wolf Walkers is basically you have the overbearing, over oppressive abbot in Secret of Kells. In Wolf Walkers, you have the Lord Protector. Yes, which is a bit worse, I would say. I, I wouldn't say a bit worse. A worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is the great thing about the villain of this film. If you were not aware of uh, the historical context of why he was being employed the way he was, he would still work as a very obvious embodiment of uh, oppression, societal restrictions and obligations, rules, gender politics, everything that's meant to oppress the people in the town, but more importantly, the protagonist which would be the character that the audience relates to. Yeah. He would still really work well as the villain in that sense because he represents everything that the message of the film is against. Freedom versus the oppression. Yes, and... More importantly, self-freedom, even as far as the father's arc is concerned. Robin's father, that is getting over his own fears and his own restrictions dictated by those fears to properly embrace his own freedom is a big part of it all. It's part of that whole embrace life's unknowns. Yes, and attain, yes, and attain true happiness. Yes, by becoming free to be who, who you want, you to, want be to be and who you are because society doesn't let you be who you are and who you want to be. It doesn't In care if you're happy. It just wants you to do what, what you're you supposed to do. Society wants you to do what society dictates you and orders you to do. The same way in which the Lord Protector obligates Robin's father to be the hunter that has to kill all the wolves and he obeys him blindly because he's afraid of the consequences, not just the immediate and obvious consequences of disobeying the tyrant's orders, which would result in incarceration or death, not just the punishment that an oppressing society, incarnated by the Lord Protector, would give you, but also because 
disobeying the rules and obligations would mean also going against the familiar. And that's also part of the reason why society is so oppressing, because it affects you at a subconscious level. The oppression becomes familiar, and anything outside, both literally and metaphorically outside of the cage, which would be the walled-off town in the film, that is, everything yeah. outside of it is unknown, unfamiliar, and therefore double as scary. The wolves are scary because they are unfamiliar, they are wild. But the wolves are also inspiring because... They are free, they run free, and they stand as the exact opposite of everything that the Lord Protector represents, which is why, thematically, he wants them all dead. They yes, represent yes. a rebellion against his order. Just yes. like the people of Ireland, with their own credences and beliefs, represent an abomination in his eyes. He's the kind of guy who would just look at something he doesn't know and yell witchcraft, which he literally does. <laughs> yes, he does. So even if you don't know who Oliver Cromwell is in real life, the way he's presented and how he inhabits his own role really tells you everything you need to know in order to enjoy the text. We touched upon the gender politics in this movie that covers... Robin, who is a female, who is a little 12-year-old girl, I should say. Yes. Basically, the law protector basically says, why is she in the scullery? Which means the kitchen and place to do the laundry in yes. the old days. Yes. Speaking of historical context, scullery is basically the highest form of education available to young women at the time. <laughs> which is awful. <laughs> yes. But, it's soul-crushing work, which is presented as soul-crushing work in the film, in the text. It's also and, thankless. <laughs> and and uh, absolutely thankless. And most of all, it keeps them in line. It keeps them oppressed. It keeps their imagination suppressed. Which yes. is the whole point. It's soul-crushing, and you can feel it in that film with how Robin looks as... She looks more tired and less full of energy. Yes, during when she's those forced moments. to do that. I have to say, I like the first introduction to the scullery in this film, where you see this long line of women, buff women, might I add, cutting fish in synchrony as if it were and modern times, as if it were the typical visual shorthand for soul crushing. Uh, industrial work. The chains that bind you to society. Yeah. You have to fulfill your role. If you're a man, you have to join the army or go be a hunter. If you're a woman, you have to be in the scullery or be married. One interesting thing about the development of this film I will bring up at this point is that Robin was first conceptualized as a boy but they changed it because they really wanted to explore, you know, that side of female society at the time, you know, just to solidify more of the themes they wanted to explore in the film. It works for the best, especially for the uh, gay reading, <laughs> the queer reading of the subtext, <laughs> which yes. is absolutely inevitable. And it's definitely there. It's that's, definitely there. <laughs> that's the beauty of such an allegory, because as we said before, in broad strokes, this is about rebelling against the societal restrictions to embrace personal freedom, etc., etc., which is a universally appealing story. But it is also specific enough with its use of symbolism and allusions Oh boy, the symbolism <laughs> that it inevitably reads as coming out as gay or maybe trans, the whole spectrum of the LGBTQ experience. I'm pretty sure this is going to be someone's Fury Awakening film. Mathematically assured of that. Pretty All much. of these things uh, can overlap and intersect as well. There is no limit to that. Specifically, I want to talk about how wolves and 
wolf walkers figure into this whole symbolism. <laughs> yes. If, so now that we've covered enough of Kill Kennedy and the Lord Protector, the father feeling chained by, you know, the familiar oppression. And now all of that is parallel to Robin's and Mabe's own story. Yes. Let's because... actually talk about Robin and Mabe's. <laughs> yes, the actual two main characters are actually meet up in the film and are the main central point of the story. Okay, so her name is pronounced Maeve, I think. It is, yeah, it's pronounced Maeve, yeah. But in typical Irish fashion, it is spelled completely differently. (laughs) Despite the fact it's spelled Maeve, so you basically would be thinking it's M-A-E-V-E, instead it's like M-E-B-H... Yes. And, 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 and if you want to get even more complicated in Ireland, depending on which county you're in, it could be pronounced Meave instead mm-hmm. of Maeve. So that gets a bit more complicated. So they go with the more common uh, pronunciation that's in Ireland. Speaking of uh, accents, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, yes. So we established that uh, Robin and her father, they come from England. They are now living in Kilkennedy. You are an Englishman, correct? Yes, I'm English. Are you sure? I'm very sure. I'm pre- I mean, I've lived as an Englishman. <laughs> I am not so sure about that. Say nuclear. Nuclear. He's English, everybody. Okay, so as an Englishman, <laughs> tell me. Where do Robin and her father come from, specifically? What part of England do they come from, in your estimation? Honestly, I'm not very good on my historical part of my accents and that expertise, but they I They seem would... to have a very polished English, a very TV English, <laughs> in that yeah, sense. Uh, if I was to say anything, it'd probably be... Somewhere like London or Cornwall or something like that, maybe? I wouldn't know specifically. Yes. Well, definitely not southern London. <laughs> definitely not the southern part, no. <laughs> I'm thinking of like the more, uh, let's see, I don't think Cornwall was in posh, but okay, yeah. It could be like one of the more posher parts of England at okay, the time. Okay, I didn't mean to sidetrack you, I'm sorry. I was just curious about this. Yeah, I do not know, sorry. Anyway. Actually, I should probably mention, when Lord Protector called uh, Robin's father good fellow, I thought that, that was just a phrase he was saying, like... Oh, no, that's fellow. his last name. That's and his no, actual that's his, last that's name. His, that's, his, that's his last name. I did not realize this. <laughs> the second time he called him good fellow, I surmised, oh, that must be his last name. It wouldn't yeah. make sense for the Lord Protector to be so amiable with an underling. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I just thought it was just being polite just to get him to do work. The Lord Protector? Mm, that would be so out of character for yeah. Oliver Cromwell to be chumly with. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I thought, I just thought in my head, well, if he's benefiting somehow, maybe he would pretend to be, you know, chumly just to get him to work. No, he's pretty stern, consistently stern all throughout the digestis. Yeah. So, a the term they... of endearment doesn't really match his tone. Yeah, true. His actual first name is Bill, from what I've read here. <laughs> yes, well, I'll call him Goodfellow. <laughs> yes. William Goodfellow, right? <laughs> it's the most uh, normal English name imaginable. <laughs> yeah, Bill and Robin are pretty common back then. <laughs> You can tell this was made by Irish people. What is the most normal, boring English name imaginable? Oh, I know. William. Good fellow. <laughs> yeah, Bill. Bill is his Bill. name. I am surprised they didn't go for John Smith. I'm surprised they didn't put a character in and just call it a, you know, a second British person and call him Ben. So we can go full hog with the reference of most common name you give a character in England. <laughs> Okay, so back on topic. (laughs) Yeah, let's get back on topic. We're about to talk about the freedom aspect of the whole film, basically with with Maeve and Mal McTyre being the antithesis to the other side. Let's talk about uh, the use of symbolism in this film. And this is where I'm going to give you light spoilers for the plot. This isn't anything that the trailer for the film doesn't already spoil. 
So don't worry about that. It is necessary to bring this up to properly establish what the wolf walkers are and what they do. So we mentioned before how this is similar to the myth of the werewolf in a more broad sense, but this is a bit more specific. Wolf walkers are people who transform into wolves when they sleep. Actually, transformation isn't the correct word. The wolf no. literally comes out of their sleeping bodies as they dream. And my gosh, the reading here of the subtext is all kinds of titillating to me. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, really. Maeve accidentally bites Robin due to a complicated series of shenanigans. Yeah. And she tries to heal her, but she's not powerful enough to do so. So Robin herself becomes a wolf walker, and the wolf, which again, I remind you, is a symbol of freedom, comes out of her when she sleeps. I shouldn't have to explain what this means, because it seems pretty obvious, especially when I put it out there in this manner. It comes yeah. out of her. Yeah, and not only out. that, not only it comes out of her when she sleeps, it is also much bigger than her, which is empowering, because it's bigger. You come out, and you are more powerful for it. It's like basically saying, spiritually, you can be free. It also ties in very well with uh, the idea of coming out as gay or trans and everything I said already before. There are a lot of shared scenes between Robin and Maeve, both in their human and wolf forms, in which they play together, get closer, and there is this one frame of animation in which they unite their foreheads as wolves, forming the not-so-subtle shape of a heart as they do so. I wonder what does that mean, or I wonder what is that implying? That, that, that just made me go, aww, to that. That would be also the end of probably the most important sequence in the film, the one in which they run into the forest at night as wolves, as uh, I'm running with the wolves <laughs> place in the background, yeah. which is the song they licensed for this film. Yeah, I believe the song for trivia, well, for a bit extra detail on that song, is actually a, a song that was made a few years back, but it was redid for the film to be uh, yes. different slightly. I listened to both versions, and uh, the film version of the song utilizes a more traditional Irish instrumentation, which makes it a lot better, in my opinion. But anyway, back to the symbolism. There is this broad, but at the same time very specific use of symbolism that very much fits with the theming of it all. During the day, when you are awake, society is also awake. Society observes you. Society spies on you and ensures that everything you do is judged, that everything you do has to fit a very specific molded role. Your involucre of flesh is awake, but your true self, your true power is asleep because it cannot come out during the day. But during night, when you go to sleep and society is also asleep and its ever vigilant eye for deviation is not focused on you, that's when you, your power, the wolf, comes out of you, literally in this sense. And you are truly being yourself. You are truly being who you were meant to be. And this, this is already... This is powerful symbolism in its own right. It is also a parallel to the real-life history of queer people and the LGBTQ community who cannot be themselves during the day, so they come out at night and they go to bars and have a good time until the police uh, barges on them. <laughs> Again, this is powerful, but very much textbook symbolism. The film is not reinventing the wheel of the rules of language, of uh, the medium, but it's taking said wheel and 
making it so much better. It enhances the wheel. The wheel is so good it can go to space, circumnavigate yeah. the sun and come back. What I'm seeing is that the symbolism is pretty obvious, but it's the animation that really drives the point home, that really enhances the use of symbolism, that really carries the themes and the theming and the narrative and the emotional core of it all. The animation is an integral part. It is the main protagonist, really, of this digestis. It's what really gives this film its drive. The way the film chooses to represent the wolf pack, oftentimes as a river of wolves, moving in sync through the forest, giving that idea of unity, but also that wild freedom. Yeah, that, that idea. Mm, yes. French, French kiss to that. <laughs> Beautiful. The way in which we see the world from the eyes of a wolf, when smells become tangible colors, and also much, much smaller elements, such as the original line art from the pencil test, yeah. still visible in the bodies of the wolves. What better way to convey the free-spirited nature of uh, the wolf Sona, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you will, than to reveal what's beneath it for those who can actually observe it. It enhances the narrative, the themes. It makes for great analytical material for us, <laughs> too. And it makes the subtext stronger. This film would not work the way it did if the animation wasn't such a strong ally to its story. Well-intentioned animation matches the theming of the story that it's trying to tell. Even better than that, the animation enhances the narrative and everything it's trying to convey. It is a true unity of the story. <laughs> Yes, it is what makes everything gel, from stylistic choice to stylistic choice. It is a gorgeously animated film in which nothing it showcases feels gratuitous. It serves the purpose of conveying an emotion, a feeling, a moment in time, or a subtext. Like I said, the symbolism would be pretty obvious, it still is pretty obvious, technically, but it would be less interesting if the work done in the presentation wasn't so stellar because of that. You need to watch this film, man! Yeah, you you have, need to yeah, go I mean, watch you have, it! You have to watch, you have to watch the film. I mean... I just adored every moment of this film from start to finish. Yeah, I had a really good setup, characters that I felt invested in, and just... Overall, everything felt paced just right. It had the proper length to, to let itself breathe, unlike Secret of Kells. Although, yeah. okay, if I have to point out a flaw in this film, the first act takes too long to get on with it, so to speak. So between the introduction of the main character, Robin, and her fated meeting with Maeve. Maeve in the forest. We had her stalking her father. Assassin's Creed. Without his, permi <laughs> yes, without his permission. Then her father spots her, reprimands her, but then she starts following him again, and then she gets in trouble with the local bullies, and then her father has to intervene again, and then she's still following him, because nobody's learning the lesson by now. So she follows him outside of the town, and then she gets in trouble again, and her father has to intervene again. And then the Lord Protector intervenes, and she gets sent to the scullery, except she doesn't go to the scullery because she gets into trouble again, and finally goes into the forest to finally meet Maeve. The philological discourse here is a bit forced, a bit contrived in that sense. There is a pit stop Every five minutes, every single moment in which it happens has a specific payoff later on in the film. It's not completely gratuitous. No. But yeah. there had to be a more cohesive way to introduce all these elements in order to justify their payoff later, including the town bullies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which also with... have a point. 
But the way the first act does it is a bit cumbersome, in my opinion. And that's pretty much the only flaw I can think of, or rather, the only flaw that really bothers me about yeah. this film. They yeah. could have done a much better job in cutting this first act in half and maybe leave more time for adorable wolf puppy shenanigans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only thing I noted on my first viewing of this film, uh, Robin basically, uh, you know, she had her crossbow, then she lost it, and then she got it back somehow. But then she said, oh, my crossbow is with these guys. And she had to get her crossbow back, even though it was left in the woods where no one would have followed her. And that kind of weirded me out of it because, okay, how they get a hold of this? Is this like a, a botch in the... Uh, order of things, so to speak. This ties in to my own criticism of the scene-by-scene progression being a bit wonky (laughs) at the very beginning. Yeah, that's the only one I've noticed, but to be honest, I just kind of, I just basically just took note of it and just uh, carried on with being engrossed in the film after that, because I did not notice any uh, continuity errors in that regard. Otherwise, yes. I wouldn't much care about continuity errors in a film like this. Continuity errors is something you bother to notice only if the overall digestis is not gripping you, which is a failure on the digestis itself. However, this was a bit too on the nose right at the beginning not to notice, even on a yeah. first viewing. Again, follows her dead, gets into trouble, <laughs> dead intervenes, Repeat that four times? <laughs> it's a bit absurd. Yeah, you know, just to go back to Maeve's and Robin's, uh, you know, bonding, so to speak. Totally uh, not gay uh, <laughs> relationship. That is the beauty of the writing of that part of the relationship. Yes. I'm going to tell you this. This is how much I like this film. If this were any other film that had the goal to have potential queer baiting and leave it entirely in the subtext... I would have been mad. Are we still doing this in 2020? But you know what? Since this is Wolf Walkers and it's so darn good, yes, of course, I'm giving it a pass. (laughs) To to be honest, like I said, uh, to continue that universal message sort of thing of freedom and basically... Yes, that's that's why it works, because the message is still broad enough that it can include many interpretations. Yeah, so basically, it's like that freedom of interpretation that you could see Robin and May's relationship as either they love each other as sisters, or it's a budding relationship of true love, so to speak. Except for when they unite in in the shape of a heart. That's pretty... (laughs) I know, I know. (laughs) Listen, it's even in the trailer. It's the last image in the trailer, too, so they knew what they were doing. Oh, yeah, they knew what they were doing. Speaking of the trailer, speaking of the trailer, do you remember what the tagline for the trailer was? I've only watched it once, so you're gonna have to remind me. The tagline for the trailer was Awaken Your Magic. Oh, I wonder yeah. what this film is about. Mm. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but but still, I, I think it, it still holds merit what I'm saying, that basically, you know, that it can be interpreted in those two ways, that it's a love between family or a love between two people that have found each other. Absolutely. This film is also about found family. This film is also very much, very openly pro-environmentalist. Oh, that it is. Literally, the prologue of the film showcases this beautiful forest full of cute little critters, and then you have a close-up of an axe cutting down, chopping down trees, and then something in the middle happens. And at the end of the prologue, when we have the opening title credits, that same part of the the forest is devastated, no more trees, and the animals no longer have a home. That's one of the few times in which the film is very obvious about its environmentalist message. It is assimilated into the thematic package of the film. This is part of the damage that the relentless expansionism has historically done to the Irish landscape. In fact, I looked this up and apparently Ireland, 
nowadays is the European country with the least amount of forest. It represents 11% of its total geography. In real life, a terrible damage has been done to the Irish landscape due to the expansionism, the colonialism, the English domination. I'm pretty sure wolves have been driven to extinction as well. Yes, it has. Essentially, the wolves have been driven to extinction in that area. (laughs) So this is where the fantasy of the film separates itself from the much sadder reality, the backdrop of which makes the film a lot more bittersweet once you start learning about the paratext. Yeah. Because otherwise the film is a power fantasy. Rebellion against the oppression, saving the wolves, embracing nature, which means also embracing freedom, etc., etc., Rejecting civilization as it is presented in this film as a tool of oppression. Which actually leads into another part of the subtext, essentially, with what uh, Maeve and her mother, Moll, represent in the Irish mythology department. Maeve, the daughter, is actually a name of an actual historical figure who was considered a mistress of sovereignty of some description. So so sovereignty plays a major role because uh, sovereignty is basically the one who commands the land, so to speak. Nice. And Maeve represents that to a T through her powers with how the forest reacts to her and her mother, but also in how they use nature against the expansion from the English Well, there you go. That's Wolf Walkers. Also, her mother, Moll, also has sovereignty being the theme as well. But hers is a little more vague, because from my research, it only connects her to the Morrigan, who typically is a goddess of death and sovereignty, manifestation of the earth and sovereignty goddess that presides over death and fate. However, one bit of research I did on this that I think clinches this reference is that she is considered a goddess of Ireland that is primarily concerned with the prosperity of the land, its fertility, its animal life, and, when it's conceived as a political unit, against external forces. It's Ireland... I love this film originally, but you know, the fact that I could do research on this film and actually find connections to Irish mythology like this and then rethink about the moments in the film that depict these things and I could go like, oh, that makes sense now. It's a great, fabulous film, beautifully presented and animated, superb craftsmanship without even knowing about the historical context and the mythology behind it. It's a universally appealing story that utilizes very non-universally familiar characters and mythos. That's how you repackage a mythology and you feed it to a potential audience. Who don't know your culture. Exactly. That's why Secret of Kells did not really work for me, because it did not do that. No, it did not. It just retold a tale, essentially, that not everyone will get. (laughs) It seems that in order to enjoy Secret of Kells, you would have had to be familiar with the context from which it comes. But that's not the case with Wolf Walkers. You can enjoy it for what it is, a beautiful, well-made film. But if you go and do your research and you find out what the references are and how the mythos are used to the benefit and the strength of the story, then you will appreciate this film even more. It's the gift that keeps on giving in that sense. I just love this film for that. It basically, it's just filled with this uh, love, passion, appreciation for their own culture. 
but they translate in a way that it makes sense to an audience that don't understand that culture or get that culture. Do you see why I compare this to Princess Mononoke earlier? Not just because, oh look, girl with wolves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say that, in conclusion, this film is a masterpiece and hopefully we might have enticed you to watch it for yourself so that you too can be indoctrinated and have our very same opinion about it. Yes. And <laughs> Agreeing that this film is a masterpiece. And it should be treasured. <laughs> uh, we should actually give credit where credit is due, at least when it comes to the direction, because this film had two directors. Yeah. Tom Moore. Ross Stewart. <laughs> Swell guy, he liked one of my tweets about this film. <laughs> this film had uh, a couple of writers on this too. Uh, story and script consultant by... G I, I'll forgive me if I get these names wrong, but Jerika Cle Cleland, Will Collins, who worked on the screenplay of this, while Jerika worked on story and script as a consultant. And the directors worked on the story, <laughs> apparently. So, yes. yes. So they had four writers on this to make sure well, they got this right. Usually too many writers means too much compromise. This did not seem to be a problem here, which is very rare. We might as well mention everybody who worked on this film, or at least the main <laughs> figures. Just know that the real people who did the hard work was the animators. They're yes. the ones who... Too often, the animators get overlooked in favor of, oh, who's this name attached to it? A famous actor who voices a character in it? Oh, a famous producer? Sometimes a director? But the animators, um, they do the real magic. And they are often not credited or thanked for it. But we are different. If you recall, last time we did a roll call for the animators in a project was in a slightly derisive sense when we reviewed the Bulgarian treasure planet. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but I say we should make this more of a tradition, if we can. Yeah. So give me some names, Davar. I'm looking at the animation department credits. Uh, let see. There was a Sandra Norup Anderson. Who is, lead, who is a lead posing artist and animator. We have an animator by the name of Emmanuel Esquire Brasserat. Esquire? It really? Sounds, that does seem like to be the name. It, it's spelt like A-S-Q-U-I-E-R. Why do animators have the best names? That person was an animator. Uh, layout artist. Uh, it's either... It's either Jose or Jose Balbuene. Uh, then we have another animator, James Baxter. James he Baxter! Oh, the man, the myth, the legend. He worked on this. That's great. That's we have, amazing. We have key animator, Dana Berezanikas. Ink and paint supervisor, tech check, Helga Christiana Bajadotira. I'm sorry, I'm butchering these names as I keep on going. No, please go on, it's entertaining. <laughs> Animation supervisor, Schwend Rothman Bondi. Posing artist, Adrian Kale. More on the ink and paint artist, Hannah Cleary. Another animator, Diane Cote. By the way, there's a lot of them. I'm, uh, I've not even gotten to the halfway point yet. <laughs> okay, okay. Read a couple of more, at least. Okay. Assistant animator, Tomislav Findrik. Let's see who else we got here. Another animator who has also did additional posing art, Anita Galgen. Another animator, Reg Isaac. Animating assistant, Lucy Juliat. Okay, and enough. Okay, and we'll go with the lead layout artist for the last one. Antonia Yordanova. <laughs> it's not even half of the entire crew who worked on this film. 
we, we thought, thought it would be nice to at least mention them because they worked really hard on this. And I would invite you to check out the IMDb page of this film to read their names and learn about their best Cast stories. Work. Yes. Yeah. Do not bother with reading the synopsis, though. <laughs> That's bad. It's been yeah. written by someone. I don't know. <laughs> Tom Moore actually cited four films as the main inspiration for this. 101 Dalmatians. I can definitely see it with the wolves. Son of Rambau. <laughs> the Tale of the Princess Kaguya. <laughs> oh, I definitely see that now that you mention it. Oh, you'll see the last one, considering. Princess Mononoke. You don't say! These, you don't say! These four films apparently were cited as his biggest inspirations that informed his creative vision for this for Wolfwalkers. You know, it's real nice to be right <laughs> every once <laughs> in a while. <laughs> Two more pieces of information I'll give on this one, uh, on this film, for extra trivia. There's an Easter egg in the form of an item during the film where you see Maeve pulling items off of Robin, and one of the items is very strangely the Eye of Crom Crua from The Secret of Kells. Ah, that's a neat little detail indeed. It is a very weird one, considering why Robin would have that. <laughs> I was more... I was honestly more curious about Robin having a mullet space where she pulled out that brush to <laughs> brush Maeve's hair. Just, it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> Just like Where was she keeping it? Oh, who knows? <laughs> oh, but the last thing is probably the most wholesome bit of trivia about this film. There's a special credit that's in the credits of the film that basically denotes uh, wolf consultants in the film. <laughs> <laughs> the names that are put in that section of the film is the animator's dogs. It is, it is so wholesome and nice. Honestly, I was like thinking, wolf consultants, wow, they had experts basically come in and say what the wolves would move like. No, they based the cute puppy movement from their own cute puppies. <laughs> that's and, what yeah, happened. And, yes, and that's what happened. And I was like, oh, that's. Oh, you'd have to hit me in the heart there with that one. Yes. Speaking yeah. of which, there is a detail that I wanted to mention much earlier, but there was never an appropriate time to do so. So the detail of the wolves showing their teeth in uh, aggression from the front, it reminds me of the wolf from the Disney's adaptation of Peter and the Wolf which was a popular musical play by Sergei Prokofiev. Do you remember that animated short from the 40s? Probably not by name, but I bet you I've seen it visually. Yeah. You definitely have. And the wolves, part of the wolves' design reminded me of uh, the wolf from that animated short, but in a more hyper-stylized manner. It conveys this idea that the wolves seem scary and unfamiliar at first, but soon enough you realize that they are just cute puppies. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact yeah. about the end credits. The end credits is where I teared up a bit. You know why? Why is that? Because there was no more film to watch! It was over. I think it's a really, really good review. It's the best possible review you can give to a film by saying that you were sad that it had to end. This is what it was for me. Technically, our review ended about uh, 20 minutes ago. <laughs> However <laughs> long. I don't know. We lost the track of time, it yeah. would seem. We just wanted to gush about this film. As well as yes. show our appreciation for all the hard work and it just had to be done, you know, to show our love for this film. Yes. So that's what I wanted to say. I wanted to just have a one final appreciation post <laughs> <laughs> about this film. And on that high note, thanks for joining us, everybody. This has been Dramatis Sermo, like, share and subscribe. I have been Mad Dog Day Master, like, share and subscribe. This has I'm... been the Varak Varon, like, share and subscribe. 
<laughs> yes, the bark right here. Like, share, subscribe, and, do and whatever. we. And this was our review of a Wolf Walker. Like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> yes, this is now gushing. Well, there was a bit of genuine analysis in there as well, if you can find it. It's mostly subtextual, clearly. (laughs) It's mostly in the subtext. We are now just sticking the subtext and making it text. Because, you know, subtext is for cowards and uh, whatnot, and how the reference goes. I'm running with the wolves tonight. I'm running with the wolves. You know, if I had any inclination to do any more work than what's necessary, I would do a supercut of all the times in which they owl in this film. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot. Okay, bye now. Take care. Flipping great. You're a